Well, would you grab your copy of God's Word with me and turn to John chapter 2. John chapter 2 is where we will be in God's Word this morning as we continue our, multi, I would say, multi-year journey, a multiple-year journey, rather, uh, through the Gospel of John. John chapter 2, verse 23 through 25 If you walk in this morning and you do not have a copy of God's Word, you should have a copy of God's Word under your seat or under the seat in front of you. Feel free to grab that copy and take that. That's a gift from us to you. But join us in John chapter 2. We're going to look at just three verses this morning. Three verses, honestly, church, that are sobering. Three verses, church, that are not always a joy to preach on. Uh, Three verses this morning, church, that really places upon me a burden uh, that is heavy and is weighty. Uh, Three verses this morning, church, that really many more pulpits need to examine. And the neglect of verses like this have left many in peril. So join me in John chapter 2, verse 23 through 25. And as is customary in our church, will you stand with me for the reading of God's word? John chapter 2, verse 23 through 25. The verses will be on the side of the screen this morning. Let's read together, starting in verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs, which he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them. For he knew all men, and because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. Thus concludes the reading of God's word. You can be seated. Pray with me one more time. Father, we come to you this morning, once again in prayer, asking and begging for your spirit to move and to help. Asking for your spirit to use your word to clarify the truth and the importance of what we're going to study in the next 30 to 35 minutes. Asking for your spirit to, to do work in our hearts and do work in our life. To bring us to a point of either rejoicing or to a a point of awareness that maybe we've never come to before. It's my prayer is simple, oh God. My prayer that I've been bringing before you, I just bring yet again, Lord, would you take this text and would you just cut through us. Not only us as individuals, but us as a corporate body. And would you have your way with us. Open our eyes to behold wonderful truths, important truths, critical truths from your law. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a type of belief described in the Bible that never truly crosses the line of faith. There's a type of belief that poses as the real thing, but upon further examination, It proves itself to be spurious and non-genuine. There's a type of belief that is out there that gives a person a level of confidence, but in fact, in thinking that they're right with God, they really have never been made right with him. There's a type of belief that says, I'm on the VIP list for heaven, when in fact, I'm really on the guest list for hell. We find this truth made clear in what many have described as one of the scariest passages, the scariest portions of Scripture in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. You know it well. Allow me to just submit these words to you, the words of Christ. In Matthew 7, verse 21, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Verse 22, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? 
In verse 23, and then I will declare to them, these are the words of Christ. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You know, one of the scariest things about this verse that I just read, Matthew 7, verse 21 through 23, is that there is a confidence that has settled upon the hearts and the minds and the lives of these people that approach Christ, believing they're right with him only to be rejected by him. Their confidence is exemplified by the fact that they rattle off reasons of proof, reasons of evidence, reasons of declaration, but their proof is indicated by Christ and his response does not suffice. Now we read in Matthew 7 the proof or the reality that there are some at the last time and in those moments with Christ where they realize they're not right with him. But we see this in the church day to day. We see a present proof of the fact that there is this false type of faith that has settled upon many and has existed from the beginning of the church age. 1 John 2.19, the same author of this gospel writes in one of his epistles, his first epistle. He says, speaking of those who were posing as Christians, those who were in the body, some even believe that these were teachers within the church. Listen to what he says about them. They went out from us. Who's us? The church. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For, this is the reason why, if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. They would have stayed with us. They would be here today. But they went out so that it would be shown that they are not all of us. In our text this morning, we're going to see two of the reasons why the verses I just read, Matthew 7, 21 through 23, 1 John 2, 19 are realities today. In our text this morning, we're going to see why the character of our belief, your belief, my belief is vital We're going to see why the character of our belief carries eternal significance attached to it. In our text this morning, we're going to see two markers of superficial faith. Two markers of superficial faith. And so before we jump into the text and look at these markers, let's get some context. Last week at Easter, we spent our time looking at what? The temple cleansing. Jesus and his disciples make their way up to the hilltop city of Jerusalem. And as they're there, they make their way into the temple. And upon arriving into the temple, Jesus sees what's supposed to be the house of God turned into a house of commerce. A place where there's supposed to be reverence. There's supposed to be prayer. There's supposed to be worship. All you can hear were animals and money changing going on. And as Jesus entered into this scene of impure worship, we witnessed last week that he, with righteous indignation, untainted by sin, steps in. He fashions a whip. He drives out the animals and he even drives out the merchants. And he declares his authority for doing so as the religious leaders look on, wondering how in the world can you do what you just did? He says, my authority is the fact that I will rise from the grave. My authority is the fact that I'm God. And the greatest sign you're going to see of me being God is the fact that I'm going to come back forth from the grave. And so it's after these actions, we pick up the narrative, this sobering section of scripture in verse 23. Turn your eyes to verse 23 with me, church. Let's read the passage starting at verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name. As we pick up the story where we left off, we learned that John is not shifted to a different scene in the life of Christ yet. The camera hasn't moved off of his time and the disciples' time in Jerusalem. It's still there. It was at the Passover in Jerusalem that we see John is highlighting something very important for us. By using the phrase during the feast, he reminds us of the fact, one, that the Passover merely wasn't just a one-day event. It was a week-long event. You would have the Passover, and then you would have what's called the Feast of Unleavened Bread that would last uh, sometimes up to a, a week. And it was during these events that something happened. You catch it there in verse 23? Many believed in his name. In the Greek, the term believed is an aorist tense. It highlights a snapshot event. A point of decision. John said many believed in his name. 
Many believed him to be the Messiah who would free them from Roman tyranny, Roman rule. But John wants to tell us there's a reason why they believed and he wants to begin to unfold that for us. Look at the reason why they believed. What was behind their belief? Look at verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name. Why? Observing his signs, which he was doing. Why did they believe? Because they saw the signs. Why did they believe? Because they saw the miracles. Why did they believe? Because they saw the works. I mean, we learned here that there were many other signs that Jesus performed during his time at the Passover in Jerusalem. And this is really keeping in line with what John says about the ministry of Christ, is it not? I mean, if we go to John chapter 20, verse 30, we read these words. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. In John chapter 21, verse 25, we read, And there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. And so there were many other things Jesus did, many other miracles he did, many other signs he did, many other works that he did. And John is saying it was during this time that he was doing these signs, he was doing these miracles, he was doing these works, and it moved people to believe. But just as quickly as John states that many believed he quickly couches this means of praise for you and I, beginning in verse 24. Do you see it there? He says, but. The word but in our text serves as a contrast to what he has just written. A contrast that centers on the Son of God in comparison to those who have believed. Look at verse 24. But Jesus, on his part, was not Entrusting himself to them. Very important. Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them. The word entrusting comes from the same Greek verb that translates into the word believe that we find in verse 23. So if we were to contextualize it or translate it, while many were believing in Jesus, Jesus, on the other hand, was not believing in them. Why wasn't Christ anxious to have this group of followers join him? Why wasn't Christ eager to welcome these people who believed in I mean, if we go back to his first miracle of turning water into wine, we see the scene and we see the story and we read about the narrative. And what do we find? We find apart from his disciples that were already following him, the people who witnessed it, they really weren't even moved to belief. At least the text is silent on that. And so we come to this part of the text and we see that Jesus is performing many other signs and many believed. I mean, shouldn't this be a means of praise? Shouldn't this be a means of worship? Isn't this the epitome of ministry success? Why did Jesus not believe in them? I mean, what's the difference with what happened in John chapter 1 verse 12 where we said, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Why didn't these people become children of God? Why didn't these people get welcomed in by Christ? Why wasn't Jesus entrusting himself to them? It's because the faith of those who quote unquote believed we learn in this text was faith that only rested on Jesus works and not on his person. It's here that we begin to see the first reason why these quote unquote believers were not recipients of Jesus believing in them. Point number one, why did Jesus not entrust himself to them is because superficial faith relies or rests on religious excitement. Superficial faith rests on, or we could even say only on, religious excitement. Now, before I tease this out, let me just put this thought before us this morning. And I want you to be considering this this morning as we work through the rest of this text. The first question I know can be a yes for every single one of us. And the first question is this, are you interested in Christ? 
How do I know that I can say a yes to that? Because you're here. At some level, you're interested in Christ. But I want you to think of probably a more profound question, if not the most important question you can ask yourself this morning. Is Christ interested in you? Is Christ interested in you? See, what we find right here is that salvation, it's right to use the language relationship. Salvation, it's right to understand it as two parties coming together. We know because scripture is clear that God does the work. But we also see in this text that as we believe, there's a faith that is true and genuine where Jesus couples himself to you. It's a relationship. You see, what we see here is Jesus wasn't interested in these believers. He wasn't engaging these believers. He wasn't concerned with these believers. He wasn't entrusting himself to these believers. You want to ask yourself the question, how do I know if Jesus is interested in me? Well, let's just think about it a little bit. Do you only think about Jesus when you bring him to mind? Do you think about Jesus for a week or two weeks and then you go off about your business and you do whatever else you want to do because you got swayed away by all the other cares of the world described in 1 John 2.15? Or is Jesus because he resides in you, his spirit is living in you, is always constantly on your mind? Let me give you another question. Does Jesus disturb your life? Do you know what I mean by that? Does he disturb your life? When you're crossing the line into sin, when you're crossing the line and crossing the boundary with regards to what is not prescribed in this word, does Jesus do business with you or is he just leaving you alone? Please hear me, church. If you're living in sin and you're loving sin and you're not disturbed by it, then Jesus more than likely is not concerned with you. If you can live and you can move and you can walk and you cannot be convicted by sin, then Jesus is not concerned with you. Or at best, you've quenched the Holy Spirit so much that you don't feel the pangs of sin anymore. And he's going to have to break you beyond remedy to bring you back. Is he concerned with you? I want you to be thinking about that. But to work out this first point, superficial faith rests on religious excitement. I mean, all of us would agree that Jesus' signs and his miracles were important, were they not? I mean, we read at the end of the gospel that he performed many other signs, many other miracles. I mean, so clearly there was an importance to his signs. But as important as the signs were and are, what John wants us to know from the earliest stages in his gospel is that true belief must rest upon Jesus' person and his words. And praise God, he makes this clear. You know, preachers throughout the years, especially the past 60 and 70 years in America, specifically with the rise of the church growth movement, have been fighting to try to figure out how to make church and how to make Jesus exciting. Trying to come up with different ideas, doing sociological studies, doing demographic studies, doing market studies, trying to figure out what's the hot button issues that people are thinking about when they drive home and wanting to address them so that people would flock into the doors. I mean, you have youth pastors who will swallow goldfish to get kids into a room to keep them excited and to keep them engaged in church. Preachers and pastors for the past 60 and 70 years have been doing this. But what we see, which by the way, Jesus was the greatest excitement gatherer. Jesus was the one who could turn water into wine. Jesus was the one who could take two fish and five loaves and feed 5,000. Jesus was the one who could bring religious excitement at a whole nother level. But what we see at the earliest stages of the gospel is that religious excitement is not enough. Faith must rest upon Jesus' person and his words. Many of us have heard the phrase, preach the gospel at all times when necessary, what? Use, maybe none of us have heard that. Use words. 
I think it's St. Francis of Assisi. Preach the gospel at all times when necessary, use words. And I know why that's appealing to us. We know why, because we live in a pluralistic society. The only sin is to tell somebody that they're wrong. The only sin is to say, no, you're actually wrong. You're actually an enemy of God. You're actually not a friend of God. You're actually opposed to God. That's the only sin. That's like the 11th commandment in everybody's life. Do not offend anyone. But again, as appealing as that is to you and I, that cannot be further from the truth. Jesus, if anyone who just modeled by his religious excitement that he brought by the miracles and by the works was, knew that that was enough, he would never have declared to people the need for them to repent and believe. Romans 10, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of what? Christ. I mean, did you notice Jesus if you read through the Gospels, John chapter 6, we don't have time to go there. But after he's doing these works, he's gathering the masses. He always weeds them out because Jesus does not take interest in people being confused on where they're really at with him. Jesus thins out the ranks. He constantly does it. And he always wants us to know that he works in remnants. If we were to go to John chapter 6, verse 66, which I think is pretty intriguing, that 666 is a, a highlight of people actually walking away from him, but that's just my own speculation. But he's literally gathering the masses and he gives them a hard statement. And in John 6, 66, we read that what? Many of his disciples left him. And we actually read in the text, he says, since he wasn't surprised because he wasn't believing them in the first place because he knew they weren't with him. Jesus does not entrust himself, does not believe in those who are merely coming because of religious excitement. Merely coming because it's Easter, merely coming because it's Christmas, merely coming because I'm seeing what the Lord's doing in my neighbor's life and I want that. Again, those are means that can draw a person, but that person still must take a step of faith and believe on Jesus, who he is and what he's declared. Superficial faith, point number one, rests on or only on religious excitement. But there's another one. Let's look at verse 24. But Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them for he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man for he himself knew what he knew what was in man. John says the reason why Jesus was not entrusting himself to them was because he knew what was inside. John highlights that Jesus, unlike you and I, was able to see the true inner working of man's heart. Jesus is able to see beyond the word and the action and discern the true motive. And to punctuate the thoroughness of Jesus's knowledge, what does John say? He doesn't need anyone to testify concerning man. He doesn't need your help. He doesn't need my help. He sees right to the bottom caverns of every man's heart. F.F. F. Bruce, speaking of this verse, puts it this way. He who is the word incarnate has immediate apprehension of the mysteries and the complexities of human nature. He does not depend on spoken words as the index to inward thoughts and feelings. The hidden depths of every heart lie open to his penetrating insight. Listen to what another commentary, Linsky, writes. The glorified Christ sees to the bottom of every heart, detects every superficial confession, every trace of indifference or hostility. We read in 1 Kings 8.39 that God knows the heart of all men. We read in, in Jeremiah 17.10, I the Lord search the heart, I test the mind. And so what we see here in John is a clear testimony to one of his major themes that he's already put forth. And that's what? Jesus is God. 
The fact that Jesus can, in his omniscience, peer at you and open you up as if you're on a, a, a surgeon's table and fillet you open and look into the deepest caverns of your heart is proof that he is the all-knowing God. Jesus knew that the belief of these people who were professing faith in him during this time was shallow and superficial and would not stand the test of time. And he knew it because he knew the hearts of all men. And so if point number one, the reason why Jesus wasn't entrusting himself to these believers, in quote, was because of their only desire being the religious excitement. Point number two The reason why Jesus doesn't entrust himself to these quote-unquote believers is because superficial faith is devoid of heart change. Superficial faith is devoid of heart change. Superficial faith is devoid of heart change. In 1936, at the age of 19, Charles Templeton, which some of you guys may know that name and many of us, have never heard of that name until right now. Charles Templeton describes uh, the night after partying where he laid in his room under excruciating weight and guilt. He described it as if a black blanket was just laid over him and he was just being pressed down. And it was in that time that he knelt down and he just called out to the Lord, Lord, come down, Lord, come down, Lord, come down. And it was in that time that he said and self-described that there was an ineffable warmth that came about him that filled him at that moment. That happened in 1936. And in 1941, Charles Templeton would go on to found a church in Toronto, Canada, which would grow very quickly. And in 1945, Charles Templeton, along with a couple of other young religious zealots, would found the organization, organization called Youth for Christ. He was the one who actually said Billy Graham should be our spokesman. It's told of Charles Templeton that along with Billy Graham, they would travel and they would minister and that they would evangelize. And Charles Templeton was such an effective preacher that he preached to crowds as loud, as large as 70,000. And on Easter one day in the Rose Bowl, he preached to 50,000. I mean, by one organization, they labeled him as best used of God. I mean, this guy was a pillar. Many actually say if it weren't for the fact that what happened to him, many of us would be saying, who is Billy Graham? Charles Templeton would be the man. But what happened to Templeton? Let me read to you a little description. Templeton said that many years that he preached the gospel, he always doubted the Genesis account of creation. And he secretly rejected the biblical teaching on divine judgment in hell. In 1957, after a long time of introspection, he publicly declared himself to be an agnostic, someone who believes there is a God but cannot really know him. And in 1986, he published his spiritual memoir entitled Farewell to God, My Reasons for Rejecting the Christian Faith. In this book, he described his pilgrimage from Christian faith to agnosticism to atheism The question you and I all ask as we read about a guy who's preached to hundreds of thousands of people. How does he get there? Some of you guys have people in your mind right now. I can think of two individuals specifically in my mind. People that I know and people that I used to do ministry with. I can think and say, how did they get there? And it's not that they walked away from the faith. That's what we, 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 we rationalize that in our minds. We, 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 we think that's what happened. They didn't, they didn't walk away. They never had a heart change to begin with. How does Charles Templeton get there? His heart wasn't changed. And how do I state that with confidence? Well, think about this. Where is this text placed? It's right before we bridge into what? John chapter 3. And John chapter 3 is going to address what? You must be what? Born again. 
God must do a radical work where he reaches inside. He takes your heart of stone and he flips it and gives it life so that you breathe and you crave and you long and you love and you desire him above all. You must be born again. You know, many of us have said, or we know people who say this phrase, Jesus knows my heart. The only problem with that statement is most of the times we say it as a commendation to ourselves, but that should be the most terrifying thing that should fill our minds when we think about that. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? The fact that Jesus knows my heart should bring my knees to tremble and quake. Jesus, because he is God and because he is all knowing, knows when someone is simply a professor of faith and not a possessor of faith. Jesus knows when a person's outward confession is not matched by an inward allegiance. And unlike religious teachers today or even pastors who can be duped, Jesus can't. Jesus can't. So I ask again this morning, I know that this is a heavy message and I don't take joy preaching this message, but we got to go with where the text takes us. Has Jesus taken interest in you? Has he entrusted himself to you? Does he do business with you? Or is it simply one-sided where you think you can come and go as you please? Are you abiding with him? Are you remaining with him? Are you walking with him? Are you growing with him? Are you in righteousness seeing your life being more conformed to the image of Christ, knowing it's not perfect, knowing you will have stumbles, knowing you will have falls, but seeing Christ in his grace pick you up like he did with Peter. After Peter denied, cleaned him off and said, get back out there and get back after it. Do you see him dealing with you like that? Has he taken an interest in you? So how can you and I know if we have saving faith and not a superficial faith? There's many things that I can say, many ways that I could try to unpack this. But what I think would be helpful is for all of us to just sit under the word of God. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. And all I want us to do for the last five minutes, six minutes, is simply just read this text and allow God, allow Christ through a parable and through his spirit to help us identify if we have saving faith or not. Matthew chapter 13, look at verse 1 with me. We're just going to simply read, and I'm just going to trust the Holy Spirit. It's going to do work in your life, and even in my heart and in my life, to confirm or to either shake up you and I this morning. Listen to this parable. Matthew chapter 13, starting in verse 1. That day Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea, And large crowds gathered to him. So he got into a boat and sat down and the whole crowd was standing on the beach. And he spoke many things to them in parables. These are stories, pithy stories that communicate a truth saying, behold, the sower went out to sow. You can picture the agricultural scene. The sower went out to sow. And as he sowed some seeds, fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate them up. Others fell on the rocky places where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up because they had no depth of soil. But when the sun had arisen, they were scorched, and they, because they had no root, they withered away. Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. And others fell on the good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some 60 and some 30. And then listen to what he says right in verse 9. He who has ears, let him hear. In other words, listen up. There's one who sows seeds, the gospel, the truth. And as that seed falls on different types of soil, there's different responses that happen. So what are those responses? Well, let's look at verse 18. 
And again, we're just allowing the spirit to do work on us as we read this text. You're going to see four different types of responses. And I'll just tell you right now, the last response is the only one who has saving faith. Look at verse 18. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom the seed was sown beside the road. Seed is sown. Enemy snatches. They maybe come on Easter. They maybe come on Christmas. But you know what? They hear it and then they immediately walk away as the enemy takes hold of it and removes any means of that bringing them to faith. Verse 20, the one on whom seed was sown on rocky places. This is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. There's a visible change in this guy. There's a religious excitement. There's a zeal that overtakes this guy. Yet, verse 21, he has no firm root in himself, but it is only temporary and when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. These are the people that we're seeing leave the churches in droves today because they realize the message of the Bible does not jive with the culture. The message of God's word does not and cannot be conflated with what the world says and what the world lives for and what the world cherishes. And it's these people when the culture they realize is no longer on their side. You know, it was one day once said that if you wanted to be a mayor or if you wanted to be a president, they would ask you, what church do you belong to? No more. If they find out you're a Christian, they will malign you. They will hate you. They will call you a racist. They will call you a bigot. They will call you a chauvinist. They will call you every single name that you can come up with. It's these people, when they realize that the world is not going to like me anymore, you know what, this whole Christianity thing, I'm done with. I'm going to walk away. Let's continue on. Verse 22. And the one on whom... Seed was sown among the thorns. This is the man who hears the word and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. This is the person who has joy, who has excitement, who's been walking in the church, who's been serving in the church. But all of a sudden they make shipwreck of their faith because there's another pursuit that comes along that takes their attention off of Christ and it diverts it over to whatever this thing is, name it. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, the things that Satan puts before us and this person is gone as well. But look at the last seed. Look at the last seed, the good soil, the one that brings forth fruit. Verse 23, and the one on whom seed was sown on the good soil, this is the man who hears the word. This is the woman who hears the word. This is the child who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold, some 60 and some 30. This is the person who hears the word, receives the word, is changed by the word, is convicted by the word, who's conformed to the image of Christ by the word, and who lives in light of the word. This is the person who uses their gifts. This is the person who gives sacrificially. This is the person who forgives when wrong. This is the person who confesses sin readily. This is the person who lives in accountability. This is the person who does not forsake the gathering of the local assembly. This is the person who strives to make God and his glory every single thing that they are longing for and the only thing that they are longing for in life. This is the person that when they fall and when they stumble and when they sin, Christ, because he's taken interest in them, brings them over and cleans them off and restores them and moves them forward in joy, praying with David, restore to me the joy of my salvation. This person bears fruit. This person lives different. This person is changed. This person is never the same. This person makes Christ their highest treasure. Let me just ask you as clear as day, 
Some of you guys may be saying, um, uh, every time you get to the end of a, a text, you give a gospel appeal. Well, I don't know what else to do. John's purpose in writing this is to give a gospel appeal. This is the whole reason he wrote the book. If you listen to the words of Matthew 13 and you realize at this point that you land in one of the first three categories, I say this out of love and not out of any level of animosity or hate. My job is to compel you to believe. But no, because I love you and I'll tell you what many other pastors won't tell you. You're not right with God. You're not right with him. And God forbid I let you leave here today without hearing a clear call to believe because life is not promised to us. There is no second chance once you meet him face to face. There is no purgatory as the Catholic Church teaches. There is no pleading on your behalf once you enter the grave. That's it. John writes, and he wants us to know at the very earliest of his gospel that there is a false faith out there that many are deceived by. And he doesn't want any of us in 2021 to be those type of believers. I don't want that for you. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, examine yourselves to see if you're in the faith. And what I trust right now is as you Listen to Matthew 13, and as we walk through this text, the Holy Spirit will confirm with joy if you are. But I also know because he's dealt with me that if you're not, he will press upon you with such a heavy weight right now that the only thing that can stop it is your stubbornness from wanting to come to the light and confess your sin before him and say, I am wrong. I have lived for myself, but I want to take Christ right now. The only thing that will stop you is just your stubbornness and your pride from taking hold of Christ. Let it go. Trust him today. Believe in his name. And find fullness of joy. All you got to do is call out to him. You don't have to be a religious expert. You don't have to have years of seminary training. All you have to do is believe that he is who he said he was. He's the God man. And he died to deal with your sins. And he rose from the grave proving that he accomplished what he came to accomplish. All you got to do is believe. Father, we come before you now. This is a heavy text. This is a heavy message, but we want to be faithful to your word. And there's a reason why, despite the way we've twisted you, Lord Jesus, and I just confess that we as a church, corporately, not just here, but just specifically, universally, we have twisted who you are in so many ways. We have made you out to be Something that you are not. And what I mean by that, oh God, and what many of us have experienced by that, oh God, is that we have made you out to be a God who is not clear when it comes to who you entrust yourself to and who you do not. We've so watered down the message of the good news of the gospel, a message that's only good news because of what you have done. We've watered it down so much and we've made it about having a better life and having more health and having more money in the bank and having a peaceful life rather than what you, you, Lord Jesus, call it to be. Pick up your cross daily and follow me. Die to yourself. He who does not come after me cannot be my disciple. I mean, these are your words, Lord Jesus. You said if he who comes after me doesn't hate his father, his mother, his brother and sister, he cannot be my disciple. We're, we know you're not telling us to hate in a worldly sense. What you're saying is you must love me above all other people in your life if you're to be my disciple. Even if that costs you relationships. So sitting under this word this morning, I know it's heavy, Lord. But I pray and ask Holy Spirit now that you would affirm and confirm those in the room who have trusted. And whom you have entrusted yourself to. And that you would save those whom are coming to a point of belief right now. Open their eyes, Lord. Open their eyes.
We love you, Lord. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen.